my uh, personal information, my email address, uh, both my personal email address and my Greg Grand Gray email address, my telephone number. Um, I do respond to those things. What we're talking about here, as it says on the top, is the new IRS audit rules. And this deals only with what is going to happen if the IRS audits, audits you. And it is effective, which is why we want to talk about this today. It is effective for years beginning on or after January 1st, 2018. In other words, in 10 days. So that there are some things in here that um, I think are important that you try and do if you feel it's important in the next 10 days. And there are other things that are in here that I strongly advise people to do in the next year. Um, so uh, let's see if we can't now move forward. So why this legislation? Again, this legislation is because long, long ago, um, it used to be almost all closely held entities were S-Corps. Now the vast majority of, of uh, closely held entities are partnerships or LLCs, LLPs, taxed as partnerships. So as far as the IRS is concerned, they are partnerships. And what the IRS told Congress is that they have to find a way so that the IRS has less work to do in dealing with audits of partnerships so they can do more audits of partnerships. So all of you that are out there saying, well, partnerships don't get audited very often, that is true. However, what the IRS is now saying is we want the ability to audit more partnerships. Therefore, we have to find a way for we, the IRS, to do less work in the course of the audit and you, the partnership, to do more work in the case of an audit. Right? Um, what I am going to be giving you over the course of the next 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, is based upon a proposed regulation that came out um, last June. Um, people had the ability to comment on it. I commented on it uh, personally, and I know a lot of other people commented on it. Uh, the, the comment period ended last August, um, so that that's nothing is there. Um, I am told by my contacts in Washington that there will be no significant changes to that. Proposed regulations are not tax law. You, we are not required to comply with it. However, in my view, as I read the law and I read the proposed regulation, I think the proposed regulation is actually beneficial um, to the taxpayer, to you as, as taxpayers, to you as in partnerships. Therefore, what I'm saying here is all of this is included in the proposed reg. The law says everything is effective 1-1-18 anyway, so basically we're moving forward in that way. Okay, default result. IRS comes in in 2020 and they audit you for uh, 2018 and you haven't done any of the things we're gonna talk about and they find that for whatever reason, um, there's $100,000 of income that should have been reported and was not. In the old days, uh, this year, what would happen is the IRS would send bills out, basically, to all of the partners as of 2018, and the IRS would then go and make them pay. That's no longer the case, unless you do some of the things we're gonna talk about. What's gonna happen now is that the IRS is going to send a bill to the partnership, not the partners, the partnership. And the partnership is going to be expected to pay that bill. Gets a little bit worse, all right? So what, why do we care? First of all, think about what happens here. What happens here is it's now 2020 and there have been changes in who owns the partnership. Either someone has been bought out, somebody buys in, you're doing a next gen calculation, whatever the reasons are, the partners that were there in 2018 are not the same partners in 2020 when the audit happened. So what happens is the money is gonna come out of the 2020 partnership assets 
So that's going to affect the current partners, not the old partners. Uh, so that's the first thing that happens. And, and you know, is that right? Is that wrong? Doesn't matter. That's the way it is going to work unless we can find a way out of it. And there are ways out of it, and we're going to talk about those. The other thing that happened, and, and this is a tax nerdy thing, and, and you know, I, I am still a tax nerd, you know, even though I, I'm retired and have been retired for a while. I am still a nerd. I still get involved in an awful lot of things. All of a sudden, if you look at capital accounts, and, and those of you that are, that are involved in the, in the ins and outs of partnership taxation, Partnerships are very important things. So now all of a sudden you sit here and this money is coming out of the partnership. And the question that you have to ask, and you know, and, and should seem obvious, however, there's nothing that tells you this is true, is how is that going to affect the partnership capital accounts? I know what I think, nobody says what it thinks. Hopefully we have time to worry about it, but I'm just throwing it out there. It's just one more issue that we have to think about. Now comes the really bad news. The IRS is going to come and they're going to send a bill to the partnership. So how do they know how much the tax should be? Well, the tax law is very simple. The tax law says that that bill is going to be calculated based upon the highest of the corporate or individual tax rate. Now, up until uh, the tax law that, that was just passed, Basically, the, the top tax rate and the top corporate rate were, were kind of close. They were like four or five points apart. That's no longer true. What we now have is we now have, assuming that everything goes as, as supposed to, a 37% top individual rate and a 21% corporate tax rate. So basically, what's going to happen here is even if there are corporate taxpayers, the bill that's going to go out is going to be at the individ top individual rate even if there are people that are at lower rates. Right? So basically what's going to happen is, here it is, you have, you're being taxed at the corporate tax rate. However, those top corporate rates can be mitigated by the tax partner, by the partnership representative. I'm going to talk about partnership representatives a little bit more uh, if we get to the end. But basically what the partnership representative can do is they can prepare detailed information, which is submitted to the IRS, and say, well, this partner that represents 15% is really a tax-free entity. They're a school, they're a, a part or whatever that is not taxed, and therefore this should be lowered. This one is a corporate whatever, and this one is whatever. And they're going to have to provide uh, in detail what that information is. The other thing that they can do and the partnership representative can do is the partnership representative can say, I'm pushing down all of this information that you are charging. I'm pushing it down to those old partners. Now, think about what that says. In the old days, today, the IRS had to go and do that calculation and they had to send out all this information to the old partners. That is no longer true. What's going to happen now is the partnership representative is going to have to do all of that calculation, send out all that information to the old partners at that time, as well as providing the IRS with all the information about all of those partners and how much it's being done and why it's being done. So all of a sudden, this partnership representative really has quite a bit that they have to worry about as opposed to the IRS doing it. Remember what I said at the beginning, really what we're doing here, what the IRS is doing here, is the goal is to get, have less work for the IRS and more work for the partnership. And that's a classic example of it. Now, however, however, now comes the question. Smaller partnerships, all right, and they define smaller as a partnership, LLC tax is a partnership, with 100 or less partners, which is really not that small in the world that we kind of live in. But hundred, if you have 100 or less partners, number one, that's the easy part. Now comes the fun part if we want to be able to opt out of this. All right. 
the partnership can only have the following types of partners. Individuals, easy. Corporations, both regular corporations and S corporations, all right, can, are both allowed partners. And the estate of deceased, deceased partners. All of those can be, uh, are allowed to be partners that can opt out. And those are the only things, they're the only types of partners that can be opt out. And we're gonna talk about the biggie in a second. Now, and we don't have to worry about this for a year, but if you're going to want to opt out, which means instead of having the new rules, continue with the old rules. If you're going to do that, that has to be elected on the timely file tax return, and I'm told there's going to be a nice little box that you can check. Right? Now, the other thing that I am told is that those that elect out of this may have a little higher chance of being audited as to why are you opting out. Um, we don't know how true that's going to be. We won't know how true that's going to be for a few years, but we're going to have to take a long, hard look and all of the people that are out there that are uh, uh, managing partners, administrators, uh, managing members, whatever it is, are going to have to sit here and say, okay, do I want to opt out or don't I want to opt out? And assuming that you fit in these categories, you have 100 or less partners, and you only have individuals, corporations, and estates, you have time to worry about this because you don't have to make this election for until the return is filed on a timely basis in a year. However, when you do that, all right, you're going to have to include in detail all right, in your election, in a separate attachment, the names of all of the partners. In other words, I am opting out for this year. Here are names and all of the partners. You know, I think that information would all be on the K-1s that you send it but it has to be included in detail in other places so that the IRS can look at it. And one of the questions that they're going to ask specifically is what kind of entity is this? All right, now, there were some articles that were written um, a while ago that kind of suggested the way around this if you had a, a partner that did not fit in this category was you could go and have what they called the S-Corp solution so that you could take all of those that did not fit and put them into an S-Corp, right? And because the S-Corp worked, the IRS came along and very quickly said, no, 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 you can't do that. We're gonna look right through the S-Corp. We're gonna take all of those S-Corp shareholders and we're gonna count them as partners so that each of them has to fit within the box that I showed you. Why do we care? You'll notice that there was one specific type of entity, one specific type of partner not included, trusts. Now there are lots and lots and lots of kinds of trusts and, and over the course of uh, a lot of years, um, I've uh, been involved in helping people set up lots and lots of kinds of trusts. I wanna talk about one in particular here. Um, I'm, I'm on the uh, uh, senior side of, of middle age or, or whatever. Um, and what a lot of estate planners and other people have suggested to many people is that they put assets into a grantor, an, a revocable grantor trust. And the reason to do that is very simple. Anyone that has ever had to be involved all right, in probate knows that probate is just plain not fun. You know, it's a pain in the ass, it's a pain in the ass to do it, you have to pay attorneys to do it, and, and just not fun. So basically the way around it is you have people, you set it up so that your assets are various types of ways so that many people um, in their bank accounts, the way they own their home, um, the way they own their stocks and everything else, are set up in a joint account uh, between their, their, their spouse. You can't do that in a partnership, right? Partnership is owned by a, a single person, a single entity. So basically the way around it to in order to avoid probate is to set it up in this 
revocable grantor trust. Now, remember what I said before, my little graphic here says no trusts. That includes grantor trusts. Now, everyone was told when this was set up that a grantor trust is no big deal. Any income, loss, credits, deductions, whatever it is in that you have in a grantor trust, the trust is not a taxable entity. I always told people it's a pane of glass. Go, everything goes straight through it. Well, that's not true anymore. Basically, what we now have is grantor trusts for this situation, for the new partnership audit rules, will take it so you can no longer opt out. And this gets to what I think you have to talk about, maybe if you choose to, before year end. Remember what I said, this is effective for years beginning on or after 1118, 10 days from now. If you're going to opt out, all of the partners have to be qualified partners on the first day of the year, 1118. So that means if, they, if the partnership has grantor trust, it re, has revocable grantor trust as partners, you have to eat, do one of two things. Either say, I'm not going to opt out. I'm not going to be able to just file this form and go back the way things were. Or I'm not going to break my grant or trust and I'm going to move forward with the new authorship rules under the new, new rules. Um, again, you have 10 days to do it. Is it a big deal to, to things and take things out of a grant or trust? No, it's not a big deal at all. It's, it's very, very simple to do. It's very, very easy to do. Um, you know, I, I am not attorney. I do not practice law. Um, but it is easy to do. And, and, if, and if your attorney won't do it, call me and I'll talk to them and, and then do it. If they don't understand why you're doing it, call me. I'll talk to them and explain it to them. But basically, that's the reason to do it. Um, and again, you have 10 days to do it. You have 10 days to make the decision whether or not to do it. You have 10 days to call the people um, that have grantor trusts in there to decide whether or not this is something you should or should not do. I'm not going to tell you which is better or worse. Um, that's not my job. My job is to sit here and say, here are the issues. You make the decision. Um, if, you, if you need help, uh, I'm around. You have my contact information. Okay, let's talk about taxpayer representatives and, and, and my little graphic here um, looks like a very powerful person. And you know, think about what we said before. Basically, the taxpayer representative right, is the only person that is gonna have contact unless you sign the power of attorney and they're the only ones that can sign the power of attorney. So they're gonna sign a power, they can sign a power of attorney to an, to an a CPA or a, an EA or, or, or an attorney. Um, but in the final analysis, remember what I said before? The person that's going to make the decision when you have, whether or not you're going to push this back to old partners, whether or not you, how the information that's going to be provided, all of that, yeah, you can go and pay somebody to do it. But in the final analysis, as far as the IRS is concerned, um, the taxpayer representative is going to have that responsibility. The taxpayer representative is going to be named on the tax return. Um, it's not something that happens after the fact. It is something that happens when you file the tax return. Okay, so who should be your taxpayer representative? Um, that that isn't that's entirely up to the partners in the partnership. It is not by, it does not have to be the managing member. It does not have to be the um, general partner. It can be any one of the partners. It can be anyone that is a citizen or qualified resident of the United States. It doesn't have to be a partner. Um, it will not be me because I won't do it. Um, but this has got to be anybody. Who should it be? That's up to the individual partner, and, and you basically have a year to do all this, and we're going to talk in a minute about some of the other things that I think you have a year to do. Um, but this is something that 
is not just a given. Um, you know, it may be. It may be that you know, if it's a family partnership, you're all going to sit around um, around Christmas dinner and say, "Okay, um, you know, you take care of everything for our family. You're going to be the taxpayer representative. It's no not a problem." People just have to understand what it is, and and in a lot of cases, it's going to be simple. In other cases, it's not going to be so simple because the other thing you have to understand is. All of a sudden, the only person the IRS is going to talk to is that taxpayer representative. That taxpayer representative can make those decisions without discussing it with any other partner. Some people are going to say, you know, I totally trust this person and that's fine. Other people are going to say, you know, I want to understand what is going on here, right? which leads to um, our next question. What should I do now? And the only thing that I want to do now is this. All right. Assuming. You, you want to opt out. The question is, do you want to opt out? You understand that by opting out, you're dealing on the old rules instead of the new rules. And the other question is, can you opt out? And if you can't opt out, what can you do in the next 10 days, if you want to do it for next year, in order to be able to opt out? Um, that's something you have to do. And, and unfortunately, you have to do it now. Uh, you've got 10 days to get it done. If you have a question about what that means, um, uh, I'm I'm pretty much around uh, for the next 10 days. So if, if you have any questions, uh, you have my telephone number, you have my email addresses. Uh, a lot of you know that. Does it have to be a partner? Um, the answer is no, it does. I'm assuming you're talking about the, the partnership representative. Partnership representative does not have to be a partner. It only has to be a U.S. citizen or a green card, U.S. resident, qualified U.S. resident. Um, but, you know, my my gut tells me that I would probably want it to be. Um, what does it say? LLCs, taxes of partnership, have to declare to be a tax. Declare a taxpayer representative. The answer is yes. When we when we look at things and we say it's an LLC taxes to partnership, think about it. The all the IRS knows, all the IRS cares about is you are filing a tax return, a 1065 partnership tax return. They don't care that you're an LLC. They don't care your partnership. Um, so that really, as far as they're concerned in this situation, you are a partnership. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just looking through to see if I missed anything. Can it be our accountant? Uh, yeah. That, let me let me tell you a funny story. Uh, I was at a, a, a. The answer is yes. It can be your accountant, not the firm, but the individual. Um, I was at a um, seminar about six or seven weeks ago, um, tax seminar, and, and a whole bunch of my friends were there, um, you know, that I've known for 30, 35 years, and, and we, we were talking, and we were kidding around, and I said to one of my buddies, I said, if a client approached you to be the partnership representatives, would you do it? And his immediate answer was no. I said, okay, I, I can, I said, now, now let me, you know, ask you the age old question. And the age old question is this, if they agreed that they would pay you full billable rates for anything that you had to do, plus they would pay you $4,000 a year if you had to do nothing, would you do it? And there was a hesitation and said, yeah, in that situation, I would probably do it. So can it be? Can it be your accountant? The answer is yes. Would I suggest it be your partner? The answer is your accountant. The answer is no. Um, I would not have it be your accountant because basically um, what you can do here is <laughs> – that sucks, Mike. I love it. <laughs> um, what, you can always just pass on that responsibility through a power of attorney. So basically as a, as a power of attorney – you're basically saying, okay, uh, Mike Coppell, CPA, 
has a power of attorney, which I have signed for this entity, you can talk to him like you were talking to me. Um, so that basically, as far as I'm concerned, that gets that gets around the situation. Um, do not have to read this out loud. Um, I didn't say who it was. So that's okay. Okay, so that's if you want to opt out. Now, so that's that's like immediate, and and those are the things that you have to take care of the next ten days, or at least think about taking care of the next ten days. I am now recommending to everyone regardless of, of what you're going to do, I am recommending that everyone do what I'm going to say now. All right, and that's amend your, your partnership LLC agreements. And I want you to amend it, I want it specifically stated in the agreement who the designated taxpayer representative is so that all of the partners slash members have agreed to it. There is no question who they have now designated to be this very, very powerful person. All right, that's number one. Number two, if you can opt out, if you're in that position, are you going to opt out? Um, and again, we don't have to do that. You don't have to, it, as long as you qualify, you don't have to make the decision whether you're gonna opt out now or not, because you don't have to make that decision to file the return over a year from now. I want it spelled out that basically in the partnership agreement, okay, we qualify for this opt out. And because we qualify, we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. And, and, you, and this is not a simple question. Um, you know, you got to sit down, think about it a little bit, push the pencil a little bit, um, what kind of tax rates people are in and so on. In some cases, it's very easy. In other cases, it's not so easy. Um, if you cannot opt out, you're sitting there and there are people there that have complex trusts in there, for example, um, that have uh, intentionally defective grantor trusts, which are not so easy to break apart in there. There's all kinds of other things in there. You're not going to be able to opt out or you don't want to opt out. Somebody's going to sit there and say, I don't want to be in there as an individual. I like having my uh, revocable grantor trust having this, you know, I'm 85 years old and I don't want to leave this in a situation where it has to go through probate. Fine. Um, so you cannot opt out. The question then becomes, do you want to have, so the taxpayer representative, if there is a situation, is going to push it up? Um, and, and we talked about that a little bit. Is that something you want to do? And all of this, all of this, in my view, you have to go through and put it right in the, the partnership agreement. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where all of a sudden uh, the, the designated taxpayer representative decides to push out or not push out or makes a decision to opt out or whatever that decision is. And basically what I'm trying to do in this case is really give the taxpayer representative directives. Yes, there are things that they can do, there are things they can't do, um, that and everything else, but basically this is telling them what the partnership expects them to do. Um, and I, I think that should be clearly spelled out to protect all the partners. Um, and, and basically this way, everyone knows, everyone understands what's gonna happen, what's not gonna happen. Um, so that that's something that, that I am strongly advocating. Um, all all the things that are going to happen with regard to the new partnership audit rules, IRS audit rules, things are still happening. Um, last Friday, um, the IRS blessed their heart because they figured that you know nobody had any else, anything else to do while. Um, I, I will tell you that you know the the new tax law. I did read it, all thousand pages of it. Um, it is in the in its comprehend. It was semi comprehensible. Um, last Friday they sent out a, a new proposed regulation that dealt specifically with tiered partnerships. Um, 
if you have tiered partnerships, um, give me a call. We can talk about that. I don't want to get into great detail about it. Again, we're talking about proposed regulations. It is always possible uh, that something's going to happen. Um, some of us have recommended to the IRS that we think the IRS has it in their authority, should they desire, to postpone this for a year. So far that they have said, well, you know, this was passed in 2015. People have had long enough to think about it. Um, it's hard to argue with that. We try. We'll see what happens. Um, but at any rate, those these are the rules as they apply today. Um, it was very important to me um, to make sure that people at least had an understanding of what is coming down. Uh, again, uh, I've done this in, a, in, a, in an overview fashion. Does it get much more complex? Absolutely, it gets much compl more complex as you try and apply this to specific situations. Um, you got to sit down, uh, talk to your advisors, talk to your financial advisors, talk to your tax advisors. Um, call me, I'll be happy to talk to you. Um, email me and I'll be happy to talk, I'll be happy to get back to you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that people understood what was happening. Um, if there are no more questions, just a minute. Okay, it says, if it's just a two-member LLC as husband and wife, should we opt out? Or what other questions should we be asking ourselves? The first question you should be asking yourself, assuming this is a, a husband and wife partnership, um, and it is husband and wife, no trusts, and should you be opting out? Um, the first question that I'm going to ask is, I, I am assuming that uh, both husband and wife are in the top tax brackets in the future. Um, and then brackets change slightly uh, as to when the top 37% bracket and, and the 38, 3.8 and all the rest of that stuff kicks in. Um, but assuming you're already in the top tax bracket, if we make that assumption, yes, we're in the top tax bracket, um, that's the good news. I mean, I, I, I'm happy you're in the tax bracket, I mean, you're making a lot of money. My, my gut tells me that um, if it's just the two of you, you're not talking about bringing any kids in, you're not talking about bringing anybody else in, um, there's no change in the ownership, why bother? Just, you know, who cares if, who cares whether it's, it's taxed at the partnership level or at your individual level, it's not going to make any difference on um, what it costs, anything. Um, but that's where where I could come down, but I would really want to sit down and talk to you in detail. There's another thing here. Can you please show your contact details again? Yeah, I think it actually comes up here. Doesn't it? Yeah, here it is. All right. Um, this is my contact information. Um, that is my cell phone number. Um, I usually have my cell phone with me, um, except when I'm working out at the gym, or even though I, I tend to carry it with me when I'm skiing, I tend not to answer it. I may look at it, and, and unless it's uh, one of our kids or, or whatever, um, I, I tend not to answer it because it means I have to take my gloves off and it's cold. Um, but I always get back to people within within a few hours. Um, my gray grand gray email address is there. Um, I check that several times a day usually. My personal email address is there. I check that several times a day. The only time I don't check it that regularly is, is if we're traveling. Um, even when we're traveling to what we call adventure travel, which means we're in pretty exotic places, um, I always check it at least once a day. Um, and But I am around for the next two weeks anyway, um, so that, you know, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to um, get back to you. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just got an email from an old client, and I, I agree. There's a lot of things, there are a lot of things that a lot of people have to talk about and figure out what 
do you know what do we want to do or what don't we want to do and what what are when do we want to do it when do we want to sit down and and especially if you have partners that you're not going to sit down with um you know husband and wife you're going to sit around pretty simple um husband wife and kids yeah that's pretty simple too except you probably don't want to talk about this over the uh, christmas dinner but you know maybe you do i mean but that's pretty simple all of a sudden you have partners all over the world all over the country all over whatever um you really have to sit down and figure out what you want to do and when you want to do it all right so somebody said thank you very much i thank all of you very much for putting up with me um i hope this was informational um you know where to find me i'm here um i think i have to click through so that you see the handy dandy um information there's the handy dandy disclaimer you saw the handy dandy thing for the office um i am very rarely there um but you can now know where to find me i thank all of you very very much um and merry christmas happy new year happy hanukkah etc